Okay, so uh, welcome to the rerun of uh, Seminar 7 in our series Grappling with Complexity. I have to apologize to everyone for making a, a technical error in the um, recording of the original seminar and losing it. Um, so our speaker, Ragnar van der Merwe, has graciously agreed to re-record his presentation so that at least we can upload it along with um, the others on our in our series as a YouTube video. Um, so what I'm going to do is introduce him briefly. Um, he'll offer his presentation and then he and I will chat um, about some of the discussion points that were raised in the original seminar. And my sincere apologies again for anything that's left out because we are relying on my absolutely dreadful verbal memory. Um, I'm far better, <laughs> far better in writing. Uh, but the series is an ongoing exploration of complexity and I'm sure ideas that we might neglect um, in this presentation will emerge later on in the series. So um, just to introduce Ragnar again a bit, um, he is a PhD student um, with the Institute for the Future of Knowledge at the University of Johannesburg. Uh, his research interests are philosophy of science, philosophy of truth, pragmatism, and complexity science. And his PhD is a, a part of a project funded by the John Templeton Foundation. Um, and his work focuses on questions related to how we can, how we can have knowledge of the world, given its complex nature. And I'm hoping that he's going to ask whether we can have knowledge. Um, but most importantly, he's going to, um, um, his research is focused on what this can tell us about truth. Uh, big philosophical topic. Anyway, um, Ragnar, thanks for redoing the seminar for us. And um, I'm going to hand over to you. Okay, so I'm just going to do the share screen. Can you see my slide? Yes, yes, it's perfect. Okay, so thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share some of my ideas and my uh, work. Um, I'm going to discuss two views in uh, the complexity theory debate, particularly with regards to the epistemology of complex systems. Um, but first, I'll just briefly outline what complexity is so that we can uh, orient ourselves. Then the two approaches, the analytic or reductionist approach and a post-structural approach. So this dichotomy sort of maps onto the classic uh, analytic continental divide. Um, I'll mention, uh, I'll also go through some of the, the problems with each view. I won't spend too much time on the analytic approach since um, most of the participants in the seminar series seem to be seem to lean more towards the post-structural approach. So I'll spend more time um, explicating and criticizing uh, that approach. And then lastly, I will offer the uh, outline of a pragmatist way forward. This is my uh, work in progress, the positive part of my project. So what is complexity? According to Arthur, common to all studies on complexity are systems with multiple elements adapting, reacting to the pattern these elements create. According to Salir, the complex system is a system that is comprised of a large number of entities that display a high level of nonlinear interactivity. According to Wang et al, in a general sense, the adjective complex describes a system or component that by design or function or both is difficult to understand and verify. Complexity is determined by such factors as the number of components and the intricacy of the interfaces between them, the number and intricacy of conditional branches, the degree of nesting, and the types of data structure. 
that just gives us a basic idea. We don't need a precise definition of what complexity is. As I said, there's two approaches, the analytic and the post-structural perspective. This is oversimplified, um, but we can, for the sake of a short talk, divide these uh, the, uh, epistemological approaches to complexity into these two perspectives. Celia's so does likewise. He says, he defines these two approaches as follows. On the one hand, there is the belief that the world can be made rationally transparent, that with enough hard work, knowledge about the world can be made objective. Thinkers like Descartes and Habermas are often framed as being responsible for this kind of attitude. It goes under numerous names, including positivism, modernism, objectivism, rationalism, and epistemological foundationalism. On the other hand, there is the belief that knowledge is only possible from a personal or cultural specific perspective, and that it can therefore never be objective or universal. This position is ascribed correctly or not to numerous thinkers in the more recent past, like Kuhn, Rorty, and Derrida. And its many names include relativism, idealism, postmodernism, perspectivism, and flat doodle. The analytic approach, just briefly, um, uh, Celia's mentions um, Chomsky, Fodor, and Searle as well, who, uh, as well as the, the examples I'll uh, discuss. Um, according to Celia's, they, those writers um, try to reduce complex systems such as language or the, the brain to some simple set of rules. So that's the kind of reductionism we're talking about, not reduction to physics or to the stuff of physics, but reduction to some basic set of principles or fundamental rules. Um, but there, are, uh, there is a physical uh, conception of complexity. Um, this is one example. Complexity is non-equilibrium thermodynamics. The creation of complexity is driven by free energy that decreases with the increase of entropy. David Christian, who's developed the big history course, takes approximately this view. All complex uh, phenomena that we find around us are ultimately reducible to um, energy flows obeying the uh, second law of thermodynamics. Uh, there's also a computational conception of complexity, quantum computation. Um, here, complexity results from quantum computation across quantum multiverse. Seth Lloyd has developed this view. There's more in Lady Min and Wiseman's new book on complexity. Um, likewise, Stuart Kaufman attempts to reduce complexity, at least in biology anyway, to autocatalytic sets. And Stephen Wolfram uh, aims to reduce all complex phenomena to cellular automata. So that's just the basic analytic approach. There are, of course, problems. Firstly, the analytic approach aims to reduce complex systems to the perfectly predictable, simple systems obeying deterministic laws. The complex systems are notoriously recalcitrant to accurate modeling and prediction, such as economic recessions, societal revolutions, and of course, pandemics. The analytic approach separates the subject from the object. Subject and object stand in a correspondence relationship, but we cannot stand outside of our subjectivity to analyze the relationship between subject and object. There is no God's eye view. And then lastly, a, uh, an ethical concern, the analytic approach seeks to reduce control and manipulate complex systems, but this can lead to authoritarianism, automation, and loss of free will. Um, so that's from Wurman 2016. I agree with all those criticisms, but on the, uh, and as a result of these criticisms, many propensity theorists, or some at least, uh, the group I will focus on, they then turn to post-structuralism and to Derrida, who has the following to say on knowledge and action. To the extent of what you know, you make a leap into the decision. This leap into the responsibility is an infinite one. You can take a decision only in a situation when there is something undecidable or you don't know what to do. You have to go through an ordeal of undecidability in order to decide. So to that extent, the result by definition is unpredictable, unknown. That is why it is an intervention which has, because it is not linked essentially to knowledge, something obscure, something even mystical. The threat of the leap I mentioned not only threatens the break with science in the strict sense, but a philosophy as ontology, as knowledge. So inspired by uh, 
Then we do uh, semantics. There's a view that's been developed by Paul Solier's um, contemporary advocates of this view include, include uh, Oliver Himan, Ricker Prizer, Minka Wurman. Um, they call this view critical complexity. I'll just call it CC for the, for the rest of this talk. And I've divided this view into two components for the sake uh, of, of this presentation. An epistemological component and a volitional component. I'll mention each and then criticize each as well. Um, so the epistemological component states, uh, given the complexity of the world and the play of difference, there are no meta perspectives or meta narratives. The volitional component states, given the complexity of the world and the play of difference, our actions are undecidable and ultimately determined by an ethical leap. Both these um, components are mentioned in, uh, or at least uh, hinted at in the previous uh, quote from Derrida. So firstly, the epistemological component, according to Wilman and Sudeus, our models are radically contingent in time and space. All knowledge is contingent and irreducibly provisional. According to Wilman et al, with the loss of objectivity, all knowledge is in principle only partial knowledge and is further generated from the understanding that there can be no metaposition that legitimizes the framing practices that we employ in our theories. CT argues that models of complex systems are always relative to some perspective. This approach advocates for a radical kind of semantic and epistemic contextualism. There are no meta perspectives and way to judge between perspectives. No perspective grants objective knowledge of complex systems. Meaning and knowledge are always relative to some variable and contingent context. Rather than some God's eye meta perspective, there is instead a melee of interacting and contingent perspectives and narratives forming a diverse epistemological network. CC rejects reification of the prefixed meta, meta positions, meta points of view, meta perspectives, meta narratives, etc. Meta connotes hierarchy, authority, oppression, and the like, notions that can and should be deconstructed. Difference ruins order, structure, and hierarchy. There is always overdetermination of meaning and knowledge. We can never get a semantic or epistemic fix on the world. I won't get into what. Uh, Difference and deconstruction entail just for the sake of uh, parsimony in this talk. But I guess if uh, you're watching it on YouTube, you can pause here and go and look up those terms. Um, they're central to post structuralism. Um, but I'll assume that the listener knows what those mean, or at least is a basic meaning. Um, so, of course, problems with uh, CC's epistemological component. Firstly, CC argues for the superiority of a post-structuralist interpretation of complexity over rival interpretations, such as reductionism or absolutism. CC does not ostensibly consider its own perspective to be merely one of many equally weighted epistemic perspectives indexed to some variable context. CC seems to be a meta-perspective that judges between perspectives. By arguing for a certain view of complexity over other views, CC contradicts its own generic claim for radical contextualism. Arguing for the superiority of one's own view, it's a factor entails assuming a meta perspective with pretensions to presiding over other perspectives. If there are only perspectives and no meta perspectives, then CC should only be preferable to rival views according to context specific norms. CC, however, argues that a post structuralist interpretation is the best way to understand complex systems and that alternative views are deficient in some or other way. CC implicitly assumes a meta perspective while explicitly arguing against meta perspective. Secondly, CCS also surely consider their view to be meaningful. If not, then it is unclear how CC could be comprehensible. However, according to Wurman 2016, the force of difference, quote, signifies the irreparable loss of meaning. It destroys the possibility of saturated meaning. It threatens the total ruination of meaning, close quote. Further, quote, meaning is the product of conceptual hierarchies which are necessarily partial and exclusive and which therefore require intervention, close quote. It follows that difference should render CC itself prone to semantic ruination and in need of intervention. So in response to these sorts of problems, 
Andrea Hurst has proposed a middle way. Um, what the first proposes that the, that, that, that the scientific modeling, conceptual distinctions, meta perspectives, meta narratives, and the like are provisional heuristics or tools that we adopt for temporary practical purposes, even if they are vulnerable to difference and deconstruction in the end. She thus attempts to get the best of both meta and non meta. Wurman 2016 likewise states, quote, we can avoid relativism by constructing meta points of view, however fragile or limited they may be, close quote. Post 2010 writes, quote, philosophers are called to configure, not methods, but heuristics, words, ideas, conceptual tools, thought strategies, to talk about the complexity of events. A heuristic is an educational device or helpful procedure rather than a fixed rule model that encourages individuals to discover solutions for themselves and itself remains open to modification in response to feedback. Heuristics therefore are developed to stimulate independent critique and engender the imaginative power to create alternative practices. However, Hearst does not tell us how solutions are found and modified, how heuristics stimulate independent critique or how we create alternative practices. In other words, how do we decide between heuristics? How do we determine which heuristics are the best ones to adopt? It is unclear how Hearst can argue against one who holds to the reductionist heuristic, for example, and without appeal to some objective epistemic standard, which Hearst avoids, heuristics must be relativistically indexed to contingent perspectives. Without perspective extrinsic epistemic criteria, Hearst's supposable way seems to, in fact, be a version of the post-structural approach involving radical contextualism and therefore suffers the same kinds of problems. So the second component is CC, the volitional component. Um, according to Wurman 2016, because of complexity or the non-closure of meaning, our decisions and actions cannot be objectively described. Instead, we must engage in contingency, alterity, and the overdeterminations that characterize our context, all of which involve judgments and sense-making that surpass calculation and pure rational argumentation. According to Price et al, the ethical moment is situated in the moment in which we take the leap from that which is known to that which is uncertain or unknown. The ethical moment is born once we enter into the gap of the infinite abyss that is created by the limits of our model. For CC, given that the complex world does not definitively reveal itself to our epistemic beckoning, and given that the available data radically overdetermines our choices as volitional agents, we are compelled to leap to existential action. This action is unavoidably ethical given its non-rational nature. CC appeals to our lived experience as choice-making subjects, specifically as ethical actors in an often overwhelmingly complex world. Our day-to-day -day existence entails an oversaturated stream of data, noises, colors, signs, signals, and opinions, making it impossible to rationally choose an objective path moving forward. We cannot sift through all the complexity that surrounds us in any finite, carefully reasoned way. Therefore, says Wilman 2016, quote, complexity which manifests as the inability of meaning to be exhausted and to correspond with itself marks the heart of our human condition, close quote. Yet we also do not and cannot freeze in inaction. We must act. This is what Derrida calls the moment of undecidability. We leap to action. This undecidability need not engender despondence or apathy, says CC. Free from authoritarian constraint, we are liberated to choose our mobile course. We are not bound by rigid imperatives of rule or reason. We are free to incite transformation. In the face of radical uncertainty, we leap to ethical action. We take a step in the dark into the infinite of this. But of course, some problems. Derrida suggests that our leap to action is motivated by a kind of ethical, mystical force that compels us one way or another. The nature of this force is ever left unexplained. In any case, CC rejects this mystical option and therefore has no recourse to develop a positive theory of ethics. There are no context extrinsic criteria, whether rational or empirical, to inform our decisions. As Women 2010 states, beyond the realization that we're always in trouble, CC does not generate any substantial guidelines, close quote. However, if we take deconstruction seriously, then choice and action in the world should be impossible. The choice between to act or not to act should be ruined by the play of difference. Like Beridun's ass, we should be perpetually frozen in radical doubt. 
Moreover, any distinction between ethical and unethical is surely prone to the same deconstruction as all other binaries. And one wonders further how we make ethical progress if there are no context independent criteria of validity. The second problem with CC's volitional component is that CC's utterances and their actions in the world seem misaligned. It is paradoxical, I propose, to make assertive utterances, but to behave in a way that contradicts those utterances. This is called the performative fallacy. According to Wilman 2016, we undergo, quote, a terrible experience of undecidability that precedes decision making, close quote. CC's understanding of what decision making and action entails, however, seems to ignore the truism that the vast majority of the decisions that we make are simple and easy day to day ones involving opening doors, making coffee, and crossing the road, for example. In a largely effortless way, we make choices and navigate the world each day without the kind of existential angst or ethical compulsion that CC suggests is inherent in our epistemic and volitional practices. We all, whether CC or not, regularly make informed choices and act rationally in the world to achieve positive outcomes. CC mistakenly equates rationality with logical totality and objectivity with absolute certainty and seems to miss that you regularly engage with the world in a way that is by all any workable definition rational. When we cross the road, for example, we identify certain features of the world as meaningful. I will stop at the curb and observe my environment. A freight truck, for example, moving rapidly along a trajectory that will intersect with the path I intend to take is saliently meaningful. I may make a prediction that the truck has a high probability of smashing me if I continue to cross the road. In response, I halt and rethink my strategy all the while drawing a memory of similar situations and calculating possible outcomes of different scenarios. I weigh up the relevant information and then make a rational decision to act appropriately, such as making a run for it or stopping and waiting. When performing such, such ostensibly simple everyday tasks, we are not overwhelmed by radical overdetermination of meaning and compelled to lead to voluntaristic action. Instead, we have experiences of the world that can be verified and pursued by others, i.e. objective experiences, we then make a rational choice based on memory, evidence, and prediction, and then act in the world in a way that is set to as paribus, effective at producing a desired outcome. I suggested that these openness and degree to which complex systems are recalcitrant to modeling, prediction, and the like. Just because there's some degree of uncertainty in some modeling practice does not imply a radical contextualism. As Mitchell 2009 puts it, we live in a world that comes in many shapes and sizes, with structures differing in degrees of stability, affording more or less contingent truths that we can know and use to pursue our goals and aspirations. Wilman et al. 2018 state that, quote, we do not have access to an objective simple reality. Such a simple or objective reality does not exist due to the absence of a center of origin, close quote. However, we, whether post-structuralists or not, some I seem to have regular access to an ostensibly simple reality constituted of everyday objects such as coffee cups and doorknobs, and we easily perform supposedly simple tasks such as crossing the road while avoiding oncoming traffic. Moreover, as Moran 2008 notes, quote, our behavior is predictable. We go to work in the morning more or less on time in a quite foreseeable manner, close quote. The dynamics of our complex world, including human behavior, are often highly predictable. If you consider all the many behaviors we partake in day to day, the vast majority fall into the simple and predictable category. If this is not the case, our survival would be compromised. We would act in any possible fashion when crossing the road in traffic, for example. If our actions were informed by an undetermined voluntaristic leap, we sh should mostly witness highly random human behavior with resultant injury. There are a multitude of ways we could act when crossing the road. It with extremely high probability we predictably check both ways, draw a memory, make empirical judgments and predictions, take one step at a time, etc. The more one thinks about it, the more it seems that we, in fact, have relatively little action or freedom. We are continuously surrounded by natural objects, physical forces, and other willful agents who severely limit our volition. If we aim, as most do, to survive, function, and flourish in the world, we best be aware of the severe constraints our environment, including our own biology, imposes on us and to navigate a careful, narrow course between these constraints. Contra CC, our volition is mostly not free, radically overdetermined, or ethically motivated. Instead, we are biological organisms restricted to a large degree by not only our own evolved and therefore limited capacities, 
but also by the recalcitrant physical objects and forces that constrain and determine our day-to-day -day activities. The objects, processes, and systems in our environment do not form a haze of randomness and therefore confusion. There is instead structure and order to the world that persists over time and is therefore predictable to varying degrees of success. Moreover, for the notion of objectivity to have any meaning at all, it must reside within the scope of our actual epistemic activity. If some epistemic criterion leads to a result that can be used to make manipulations and predictions replicated by others has explanatory power, pragmatic utility, and is consistent with other parts of established knowledge, then such a criterion is as objective as we can hope for in our complex world. We do not follow strict laws of inference, as the analytic approach may suggest. Our everyday calculations are rough and ready approximations. Nonetheless, we follow a set of parables rules that are demonstrably effective. We regularly and reliably make judgments about and perform actions in the world. If there really is such a thing as difference operant in all complex systems, it seems to play a trivial role in interfering with our day-to-day -day knowledge, choices, and actions. So in conclusion, the post-structural approach accurately captures the nature of our relationship to the complex world. We need a pragmatist approach where we accept that even if we cannot reduce and understand complex systems entirely, we can nonetheless make good sense of and act rationally in the world. We are largely rational beings who use reliable models and follow ceteris paribus rules about an objective world that are demonstrably effective in granting understanding and in guiding action. Thank you very much. The end. Ah, thanks, thanks, Ragnar. Um, let me try to um, uh, start my video so we can actually um, converse a bit. <laughs> there we go. Okay, excellent. There we are. That that's um, okay. So so thank you. Um, I think yeah. Let let's chat a bit because obviously now you're talking to a person who's very much steeped in the post structuralist tradition, um, and um, so obviously I'm jumping up and down every time you say something and thinking, what, what, what? <laughs> so I'm not going to go there. I think we, we maybe just um, uh, very briefly, because I really want to try and remember what other people said in the seminar rather than um, jumping up about the post-structuralist thing. So just very, very briefly, I think the, the, the thing that bothered me right in the beginning was your con use of that conjunction versus <laughs> and I think there was quite a bit of who not who are but play about that I, I got teased quite a bit by Chris also Brooke about uh, you know Andrea versus the <laughs> the male philosophers um, but um, the thing that bothered me there I guess is that it reflects a kind of constitution already of a binary opposition there's always this versus that often between competing alternatives or rivals. And usually the implication is that you make an either or choice between those. So it makes complete sense to me that you avoid that either or choice and opt for something different, something that you say draws together the best of both approaches in some way or another. Um, so that I completely sympathize with. I think that's right. I think, though, that the trouble with the way that you've set the problematic up was quite extensively discussed in the original seminar by Minka Wurman. Um, and I think you could probably sum up her response in a nutshell with that kind of straw man metaphor. Uh, so, for example, crossing the road is completely, of course, a matter of rational calculation. And it's not at all the kind of philosophical decision in the face of the undecidable that Derrida wants to theorize. So in a way, what you've done is you've taken post-structuralist thinking about decision in a very specific and careful philosophical context and translated it to a matter of trying to decide whether to cross the road and it becomes absolutely ridiculous and then you say okay post-structuralist thinking about decision is ridiculous I mean this crossing the road thing that's just dumb and everyone's saying yes of course it's just dumb that's not what they mean <laughs> so in a way I think that there would be that kind of yeah you got to read them a little bit 
better, but a little bit more justice, I think, particularly Derrida, I would think. But generally speaking, I think what you're trying to say the post-structuralists are doing is oversimplified. And then when you propose a pragmatic way forward, to my mind, it does nothing substantially different from garden variety kind of post-structuralist position. They really are thoroughly in agreement with you. So <laughs> it seems like in a way, it's certainly with the post-structuralist approach, you're pushing it into an extreme kind of position where it is ridiculous. And then you are ridiculing it. And that is very annoying to a lot of post-structuralist thinkers who look at this and say, what, what, what? And yeah, so you're going to antagonize a whole lot of um, uh, people with whom your thinking is actually quite compatible. So, so that would be just something I would think about. I mean, I, I don't know about the analytical tradition. I know nothing about it, not enough anyway. But I have a feeling that the straw man metaphor might apply on both sides of the coin. I don't want to say anything about it because I don't know enough to say that. But it might be worth thinking about that. Um, that philosophy in general has moved away from posing those kinds of extremes. Um, and that there is very much more a complexity discourse going on on both sides of the coin, which make these positions quite compatible. Hoping that I'm right about that, I don't know. I might be wrong, but that would be some. That would be an overall kind of um, comment that I would have. I don't know if you want to chat about that in some way. There, there. I mean, I'm, uh, before we go into trying to recall what some of the other um, discussion points were. Yeah. So you see, there's some oversimplification for the sake of a of a 20, 30 minute presentation. Um, I think though, Schulman, yeah. Um, I mean, you have to draw some distinctions in the world to make, to, to, to have a, uh, to, to have a meaningful yes. discussion. And that distinction between analytic and structures is drawn by CCS themselves. Um, and they oppose themselves to the analytic. Their whole argument is that this reductionist analytic approach is wrong and we need this new sensitive post-structuralist Derridean approach. I mean, you have to argue that way, even if that's... Uh, I think yeah. so, but again, then this would be another thing that I'd be wary about, that to, to think that the post-structuralist approach says that approach is wrong, we are against it. Um, it's more like there's an inadequacy in that approach. It's necessary, it's useful, but it doesn't do enough. One has to think of it. And I mean, I think we chatted about this in the beginning, about that um, the, the two economies that Derrida talks about. So in, in one sense, there's a kind of what you call analytical economy of thinking, which has to happen. The calculable, the um, um, measurable, the just every kind of prejudice, I suppose, that you could put into uh, what you call an analytical way of thinking. That's there. That's absolutely necessary. And we cannot do without it. But it doesn't do enough. So then there is this other economy, the an economic, that kind of chancy, uh, unexpected, emergent things happen that you can't predict all of that that's also there but if you get lost in one or if you get lost in the other you, either way you hit paralysis and so you have to try to find a way to negotiate both of them together all the time um, and that's exactly what you're saying so I think you're you're right in intuition maybe it's the labeling that's a problem Maybe one ought not label it analytical versus post-structural. Maybe you could get out of that labeling paradigm and you probably will find then that you're going to antagonize less people because you can talk about two modes of thinking, which are definitely there. That kind of desire for calculation and order and absolute certainty and knowledge. And I mean, that's what science does. So of course, I mean, that's just, absolutely necessary and it's been productive and useful but it's also dangerous if you only do that i think i mean that so i would be wary of conflating the idea that 
there's no absolute or final or complete or given X with there's no X. So you, you, you kind of, and, 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 and all even post-structural thinkers do this too. They say, there's no meta perspective. There's no meaning. But what they're actually supposedly supposed to be saying is that there's no absolute, there's no final, there's no complete, there's no given meaning. It's always open to some possibility of change or movement. So there's nothing absolute, but that doesn't mean there's no meaning at all. So that kind of conflation, I think, happens all the time. And if you're reading post-structuralist thinkers and they're saying that kind of thing, one's got to be just very careful about it, I, I would think. So, uh, okay, there's, there's quite a lot there. Um, I know. So, <laughs> so what, what bothers me is that, okay, I'm not saying that post-structuralists say that there's no, that they, or that they want to say that um, everything's radically contextual and there's no you know, objectivity and so on. I'm saying it's a logical consequence of the view because for them, these important uh, epistemic notions such as uh, uh, rationality and objectivity, I mean, they, 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 they see that they, they, they they target that, so there, there, there is no, uh, or if there is, it's only indexed to a specific context or paradigm. And so the consequence of holding a view like that is a kind of a relativism where there's no perspective extrinsic criteria, epistemic criteria that can decide between perspectives or paradigms or whatever. So I know that that's not what post-structures say, but I'm saying that's a consequence of the view. And so what you end up with, if you uh, analyze the position, is you end up with this radical contextualism with only the aneconomic. And saying, well, no, 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 it's not just the aneconomic, there's this other economic, which we, you know, there's, there's a number of problems doing that. The first is that it's drawing a strict dichotomy, which is forbidden by Derrida's own, uh, you know, stipulation because whenever someone draws a, a dichotomy post to say no no there, there's there's no dichotomies uh, or no distinctions difference ruins any kind of distinction there's no hierarchies no binaries the post themselves when so suitable you're saying there's no there's no there's no yeah. um it, it's but that's how they speak yeah if if that is how they speak it's a problem it's something that one needs to think about very carefully and read very carefully um, and, and I think that this is something that applies both to people who um, write and read and speak within that tradition and, and people who are trying to read them, because it's an incredibly fundamental and important, um, well, it's certainly a distinction or a, 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 what shall we call it, an insight that Derrida insists on, to say that there is no absolute final, complete, or given meta perspective, meaning, whatever, you can put anything in that, um, that dot, dot, dot. So there's no absolute final, complete, or given X. To say that is not to say there's no X at all. Um, sure, but it's just, always indexed that, to your perspective. That's what you're saying. Yeah, so I mean, that, that, that's the thing. I think that you're, you're actually saying something incredibly compatible with what Derrida says, but you need to grant Derrida the, um, a, a much more generous reading, I would say, um, because I think what you would find in Derrida is a whole lot of resource for the kind of position that you want to articulate rather than some um, position against what you're trying to say. And every sure, time I, I, I do, I mean, that, that's why I'm paying attention to it. I mean, I've yeah. spent, you know, almost a year now researching Derrida and Salias at Worldman. I wouldn't be bothering with it if uh, I thought it was meaningless. I think that the analytic and the post-structural approach can both uh, learn from each other. And my attempted middle way is an attempt to sort of straddle, you know, the, the traditional yeah. and really continental divide. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, great. My problem with the post structural approach, and why I don't think it's just saying the same thing as me, 
is that there's no context extrinsic epistemic criteria that the constructors can appeal to to settle disagreements or to appeal to to convince others. Now, I didn't get to it in the talk, but my uh, move later on in the project is an empiricist move where we point to um, the output of, of, of successful empirical inquiry in science as an objective determinant of what our epistemic commitments should be and so on. Now, the postdoctors can't do that. They can only say, we trust science within a certain paradigm or because it's currently the dominant paradigm or something like that. They can't in any meta way say that anything is right or wrong or true or false. And I'm against that aspect. Okay, um, but again, anything is absolutely right and wrong, absolutely true or false. There's a degree to which you can accept uh, a kind of fitness for purpose, um, but that's pragmatic. <laughs> so anyway, okay, let's let's not get stuck on this. I think that that there's a lot to think about in that process. Um, I'd kind of like to just try and remember. I mean, I remember that um, Jean um, Bolton was questioned your positioning of non-equilibrium thermodynamics on the kind of reductive and analytical side of the coin. So I'm not really sure of this. I just remember her being worried about that um, because she uses this thermodynamics as a kind of underpinning for her attempt to understand complex systems in terms of irreversible process. So, and that in principle can't be reductive. So I don't want to speak for her at all because we'll be hearing from her in much more detail later in the series. But I wondered if you wanted to chat about that a tiny bit or maybe we should just wait to hear what she actually has to say. Yeah, so I think there's, there was a bit of a, a conceptual misunderstanding there. Um, oh, she did actually say that, yes, maybe in physical thermodynamics, there is this reductive project, but what she's doing is not reductive. And that's fine, because what she's doing, I went and looked at her book and so on. I didn't read it in two days, but I did look at the, the cover and everything. And um, as far as I can tell, what she's doing is sort of taking inspiration from thermodynamics in uh, physics and chemistry to build a higher level theory about complex social and institutional systems. And that's obviously not, well, you could debate, but it's, it, it, I, can, I can see why that's not reductionist. Okay. What I'm, what I'm referring to is the scientific project where um, thermodynamics is used to, ex, to, to explain or to sort of be a unifying principle that explains all complex phenomena. And so, um, I mean, one can even argue actually that post-structuralism is reductionist in that it attempts to reduce complex phenomena to a post-structuralist understanding. And so a paper that I've just sent off now for review, the first paper that I'm writing about critical complexity and, and all of this, I pretty much make that, or that's part of the argument is that um, we cannot help but build meta perspectives or reviews. And CCS themselves say that, that in order to understand something, we have to reduce it. We always have, you know, modeling or understanding entails a necessary reduction or simplification. Um, so I think Jean and I had a bit of a misunderstanding over what reductionism means and on. But I, I think I, I can see what she's. I mean, if I take quantum mechanics and I use it to, you know, like some people do to sort of build theories about the mind or you know quantum consciousness or whatever, that's not a it's not trying to reduce everything to quantum physics necessarily. It's more taking a low level theory and using this inspiration to talk about a higher level. Um, Okay. Phenomena. Yeah. So I, I think uh, I, I understand George Jean was getting at there. Okay, right. 
Um, I still want to press you on the post-structuralist label. <laughs> I really do think you should get rid of it. But um, uh, yeah, it keeps on making one's eyes kind of what? <laughs> you know? But anyway, um, OK, so perhaps we can kind of segue all of these discussions into that question that was raised by Bruce Jantz concerning what it is that philosophy actually does. And I actually, to be honest with you, I can't remember what the question was about. I just remember him raising this question of what is the philosophical task and maybe what has it been and what is it today? Um, I suspect that if one had to answer it, it's going to have to be, well, what is the philosophical task today uh, would have to be related to the idea of kind of giving us insight into the human condition of complexity. Um, it would give us discursive tools with which to articulate this insight and some form of guidance regarding action. That seems to me to make sort of sense. Um, I, I imagine that that's also what you're trying to do. Um, so I would kind of put the tasks in terms of giving us a kind of a language of complexity um, in its broadest sense, that it would give us insights, metaphors, heuristics, rather than a science of complexity, um, which would give us knowledge and frameworks and fixed rules. Um, now, I hope I'm being, and in fact, I know I'm being absolutely reductionist there myself because science never does that. Science is also a very complex enterprise which i think always also gives you insights metaphors and heuristics so <laughs> i think i better retract that one otherwise I'm, I'm falling into my own kind of um you know I'm, I'm doing exactly what i say one shouldn't do um but i wonder if that makes some kind of sense um that uh um i i mean i don't know if you recall what bruce was talking about um in the really i'm afraid um... yeah yeah. Um, I, I can't remember, but from what you said or your summary of what he said, it sounded like more of a normative project. And I spoke to Minka after the talk and she suggested that I go in, in that sort of direction, which I may ultimately do. But my project is not normative as it seems to be with most um, philosophers focusing on complexity theory. It's ultimately a normative project about how we should live or about how systems should be organized. Um, what I'm doing for now is merely saying, okay, these, this group say the world works this way and this group say the world works this way and it doesn't work either of these ways, it actually seems to work this way. So it's a descriptive project. So my argument against CC is simply that they're saying knowledge, modeling, science, etc., work this way. And I'm saying it doesn't work that way, it actually works this other way rather than we should do this or this is how we ought to you know, build our uh, po 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 political systems or something like that. Okay, okay. That may come later, but it's purely for now. Then if you move into what Chris was saying, because the language or the discourse of pragmatism is normative. So maybe you would also have to relabel in a way, maybe, because I mean, Chris was talking about um, the question of whether the language of pragmatism is the best philosophy can offer. But now he's very much talking in the normative um, and ethical dimension and political, because he was referring to those pragmatic choices of the early yeah. political figures, or early mm -hmm. South African kind of ANC leaders. And as far as I recall, he was wondering whether the pragmatic choices were adequately kind of ethical or socially just. So it's very much a normative project. So the minute you say pragmatism, there's a whole bunch of philosophers that will definitely take it as normative. Um, yeah, it's not the kind of pragmatism I have in mind. Maybe I'm not a pragmatist then. But, um, <laughs> I'm, I mean, one can still make a descriptive pragmatist argument in that I'm saying the world works along pragmatist lines. I'm not saying you know, so so it's not so much, I mean, I don't think, I think the post-structuralist has to say this, but I don't want to say that our best science is only correct or, or we seem to think it's true purely because it's useful or it serves our uh, normative uh, interest. Um, I think the post-structuralist has, 
Sorry. I said, which is neither the case. I mean, it's not always useful. Sometimes we've had absolutely horrible consequences of, of our scientific, um, you know, kind of endeavors. It doesn't always. So, so, so can, I, can I just ask you something quickly? So, so let's say, as a post structuralist or so called post structuralist, if how would you argue against a flat earth? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I would um, have to take recourse to the best available as far as science goes, the best empirical evidence that we have. Um, but if they say, I just, I, I have a different, I have a different paradigm that I live in. I don't subscribe to that. What, what you, you know, you, what uh, you're calling our best science is just relative to your paradigm. And it's a problem that every relativist has, and so as I can tell, the post has the same problem, and that you cannot appeal to something context extrinsic to convince the flat earther that the Earth is round. You could only say, well, from my view or from you know the the dominant paradigm, the Earth is, is round, and you must come over. Yeah, there's intersubjective agreement. That's the best. Uh, well, this is Gardamer, I suppose, but it's it's the best we have at truth that there is um, a certain amount of re replicability of um, you know stuff there's um, a degree of agreement so intersubjective agreement that's what you have as and that you can argue as well there's um <laughs> I mean, it, it's kind of complex, but a flat earther would not be able to offer substantial and um, significant and adequate uh, empirical evidence that a large number of people could agree upon. Um, that's the only way I think one could actually uh, justify a belief in <laughs> you know, a, a global universe rather than a flat earth. Um, there just seems to be an overwhelming amount of empirical evidence that suggests a round earth. And it's very, very difficult to um, mm -hmm. offer enough substantial evidence to kind of um, uh, question that particular way. The evidence for the post structures or for the royalty and pragmatist. So what Chris also seemed to he was thinking of royalty as a as a pragmatist. And royalty, I would clump since we have to make categories and I would have clear and dialogue. I would clump uh, royalty with the post structures because of the intersubjectivity and uh, truth and objectivity and reality always indexed to a community of speakers, not anything out there. And I want to hold on to this out there. So empirical evidence is a context extrinsic of objectivity is not intersubjectivity, it's of the object of out there. And we can appeal to that as a context extrinsic criteria in order to argue against the flat earth. Whereas royalty or the post structuralist, as far as I can tell, can only argue against the flat earth by saying you don't agree with all of us, or you don't you you're not partaking in our intersubjective agreement. You can't appeal to in, empirical evidence as something out there that is actually binding in any kind of human uh, ex extrinsic way. And that think, looks like a you know, of relativism. Pushing again, pushing a so-called post-structuralist view into something a little too extreme. Um, I know Rorty and I mean, and uh, <laughs> I won't say Rorty and Derrida, but there's been a lot of kind of um, contention. I, I, don't, um, I don't think that Rorty is a good Derridian. I think Rorty is an extreme. I mean, he went from analytical philosophy whack way into the that like lost in the funhouse stuff. And I agree, there's a lot of lost in the funhouse stuff out there. I don't consider that to be post-structuralist thinking. <laughs> but you know, I mean, so so maybe there's also something in this term that's annoying, or or is that it's a blanket term for a whole lot of different positions. Maybe that's part of the problem. I'm not sure um, that 
when you talk of the post-structuralist kind of thinking, but you're not, not actually describing me, maybe I shouldn't be calling myself that if that's what you mean by it. And I think that happened to Derrida, it happened to everybody who, and, and, and a lot of them issued that label. It's like, do not label me that because if you lump me together with Rorty, gotcha. I, you know, I get really upset. So, so I think there might be something in the discourse that you're using that you might want to think about quite carefully um, because it, it, it's sort of, um, I mean, I think there's something very important in what you're saying about this middle way and about um, uh, issues of, I don't even want, want to call it pragmatism anymore, but whatever it is, the complexity stuff that you're doing seems very important, but the labels that you're using um, are going to make it difficult for you, I think, to actually converse with um, other uh, thinkers. Um, maybe, maybe not. Maybe you'll irritate enough people that they'll actually want to be talking to you. I'm not sure. Um, so actually, just one of the last things I, I want to chat to you about, um, and that is that one of the post-seminar comments that came my way, and now this is a, a reflection on the whole of the seminar, was that the discourse is way too abstract, and that uh, complexity people should be considering real life scenarios um, to bring this complexity philosophy to bear on real life. Uh, I'm not sure what you think about that. Um, Crossing the road is quite a real everyday life. I guess my talk was would yeah. satisfy that comment. That crossing the road was um, not a good example. That was ridiculous. <laughs> so, you know, or, uh, yeah, so you'd have to really think very hard about the, the Derridian distinction between calculation and decision before you think that crossing the road is a matter of Derridian decision. <laughs> that, that, you know, so, so, okay, yeah, you'd have to read a bit more Derrida to, to, to make that, that work. Um, so, what, so, what, can I just ask you what, so if, if in cases like crossing the road, difference and other Derridian concepts don't apply, they, that's the economic dimension where they don't apply, they're only applying this other dimension, which I'm saying, I already said it's a problematic distinction, but let's just assume that, that we can make that distinction. So Derrida's uh, semantics and, and the implication of his semantics only applies in certain cases, not in other cases. So can you tell me in what cases it does apply, if it never seems to apply in the cases I bring up? So as, as far as I would understand um, Derrida in terms of the, the so-called plural logic of the aporia, um, if, if you're going to try to make a decision about crossing a road, um, it's a calculation. You have a certain um, knowable entities, noble criteria, and you can make based on, as you say, the speed of the truck coming by, the, the distance of the road, all these noble quantities, you can make a rational calculation about when to cross the road. Um, that is part of what you would call the economic difference. There are meanings, there are structures, there are things that you know, there are um, interweaving kind of patterns. You can kind of um, use all of that information to make a rational decision about when to cross the road. And that would be your economic style of thinking operating quite productively to enable you to walk about in the world. Um, however, there is always the chance that something that you did not take account of is going to trip you up. And that is something that you cannot factor in to your rational way of thinking. So there are times when people cross the road and get nailed. Um, and that is because that process, that economic process of rational kind of calculation and calculability and working out and all of that just can't do the job fully, completely, and absolutely. If it could, then nobody would ever make a mistake crossing a road. Um, but there is this element in life itself which is just incalculable and it can trip us up at any point. So that's a metaphor. The, the crossing the road thing is a metaphor for the interaction between two 
different kinds of, um, what would you call it, uh, uh, understandings or modes of approaching the world. Not, let's not say understand. Two, two I, I agree with that. Yeah, for sure. That's why I've said ceteris paribus rules and it's always uh, rough and ready. But yeah. Rinde Vida talks about the, the, the leap into the unknown, the abyss, the, when Wurman and Celeris talk about the radical moment of undecidability and we have to leap into the infinite unknown. What, what are they talking about? What, can you give me an example of a case where that actually applies? Okay. Uh, should I, I'm pregnant. Problem is I'm 50. I don't flip in one and be pregnant. Must I abort the child? You tell me. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I can't, uh, I need more context, I guess, but. Okay, yes, I mean, exactly. you'd need more context. That's exactly right. So, okay, what, what more can I give you? Let's say, um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid this child is going to be uh, Down syndrome or something because I'm 50. Um, I, I'm, I don't have a partner who lives here in my home. I, I don't think I'll have enough uh, capacity to care for it. And I don't flip and want a child. I just don't want it. I don't know, is that more context? Will that help you make that decision? I just think these are cases that come in degrees. And so the distinction between economic and economic is problematic, or the distinction that Celia's and Wilman draw between the complicated and the complex. All okay, the easy that's cases. Not this, that's not what this is about. This is this radical moment of making a decision about something in the face of the undecidable. There's nothing extrinsic in the sense that you're talking about extrinsic in terms of empirical data or whatever. In this circumstance, there's nothing extrinsic that can give me criterion for making that decision. On what I grounds? Think are. I mean, you. What? Well, you were exploring all the different possibilities, and that's sort of using rationality. You might look at. I mean, you, you cited empirical evidence of uh, Down syndrome uh, probabilities, and you'd, you'd weigh these all up, maybe not in a strictly calculable way. If you don't, you, you aren't just going to leap blindly to a choice. You're going to do as much research and as much thinking and ask for as many uh, other opinions as you can. Yes. It's, as, it's more confusing than crossing the road. Yes. Um, but it's not some radically different domain where the structures seem to talk about the economic and the uneconomic as if they're just two completely separate. No, 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 Derrida doesn't do that. He talks about it in terms of this interminable interplay between these two ways. Um, and there's, there's no getting out of either one and there's no getting stuck in either one. If you get stuck in the kind of economic way of thinking, you, you move towards a dead end in your thinking. If you get stuck in the kind of an economic free play, you know, nothing can be, you know, um, you know, everything's relative, whatever, there's only chance, blah, 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 you also get stuck. So it's a paralysis either way, and you constantly, the only way to move is to keep them together, keep them knocking against one another, and you can't harmonize them, and you can't balance them out. You just keep on knocking against, I mean, every time you do something mm -hmm. economic, every time you say, yes, I must get a paradigm or a framework within which I make a decision, you've already violated the fact that um, there's a contingency that you can't take account of. Every time you say, oh, it's all contingent, not gonna, um, whatever, you've already violated the fact that there can be um, uh, certain, I won't say rules exactly, but certain uh, criterions or criteria within a certain framework that help you make a decision. But going back to the abortion, think about it really hard. I mean, when I finally take everything together, all the contingencies, all the, the, the kind of um, 
possibilities, all the calculable sort of knowns and unknowns, what will happen, will it be a bad baby, will it blah, 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 I don't even want it, la, 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 can I afford this, la, 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 everything. Ultimately, I have to weigh everything up and decide, okay, that is what I'm going to do. I'm going to abort this baby or I'm not. And that moment is not calculable. You cannot, because there's so many unknowns um, that you are working with. You need an infinite amount of knowledge about the future, about what will happen, what the, um, and if you were to calculate a good decision there. Ultimately, in the end, you're on your own for that decision, those kinds of decisions. Um, and it's then, really a leap in the dark, though, because you, if you spent a lot of time doing research, drawing on empirical evidence, speaking to experts, you would have a, a, a lower probability of disaster and a higher probability of making the best decision. Otherwise, you wouldn't bother. Maybe, now, but you won't have an absolute, you cannot make it sure. an absolute calculation. Right, and that's all he's saying. He's just saying, listen, you, well, you might have a probability of making a, a, a better or worse decision, but you don't know. Um, you'll never know. So you have to actually just decide this is what's going to happen. So that, uh, and and um, you have to accept the fact that you're doing the best you can with what you've got but you don't have absolute knowledge or absolute power. So chances are your decision might be bad, but you did the best you could within your limits. But you have yeah. limits. Yeah. Definitely. definitely. I, just don't, I just don't see any of that in Derrida. Like he never talks about probabilities or degrees. He, he in fact criticizes the notion of degrees. There cannot be own degrees. It's always undecidable. So, Derrida definitely pushes more, you know, he, he makes no attempt to talk about graded degrees of certainty or a probability theory of um, knowledge or anything like that. He always, as far as I can tell, whenever there's a sort of uh, a, a crack in the system or whenever difference comes in, it fractures the whole system and there's radical undecidability and we're kind of, we just have to leap. I mean, that's what I keep getting from post-structuralists too one-sided. I mean, you'll find it over and over and over again, there's this kind of insistence on using the concepts of the so-called, um, and I'm going to just call it analytical, that's your label, I don't think it's the right label, but there is always this kind of, okay, here is this approach that is economic and it has to be used, it's the best we've got, but don't be ideologically sucked into believing that this approach is absolute, that it works, and that there isn't the chance of it being undone, tripped up in some way. Um, that's all he's saying, um, but I don't think he's talking about radical whatever, whatever. However, I think... Are we ready? <laughs> I think that... The word radical is used constantly. No, I think there's the, um, I do think maybe um, one has to think about the context within which these kinds of thinkers were working. And that would have been an absolute insistence on positivistic. Um, so they were always brushing up against that. So you might find that in their, their own discourses, that knocking against this rigidity is, is emphasized more than the necessity of keeping the rigidity, well, not rigidity is the wrong word, but keeping the, the, the structure there. But um, so I think you might have a point in the sense that the, the critique of economic ways of thinking is quite strong because they were writing in the 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, and um, they were writing against a very dominant paradigm of positivist philosophy um, and trying to disrupt that. So that disruptive mm. moment is, is you know, something mm. that they, they do harp on. Um, but yeah, that is something that uh, Minka brought up, you know, that the, and then you, you get that in Celia's writing that uh, 
it's really just a modest project to remind us that there's always this an economic dimension or this uncertainty. And if that's all that it's about, then great. You know, it just yeah. doesn't come across as the, that that it's all it's about. It comes. I mean, you need thousands of pages to say that as well. So it comes across as a <laughs> lot more a legitimate criticism. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's sometimes when one wants to throw these damn books against the wall because you've read 400 pages and you think, is that all you're saying? Um, yes, so absolutely. But perhaps we should end on that note. I think that that's a very, um, um, and, you know, interesting note to <laughs> end on that there is a certain possibility of a rapprochement um, with the post structuralists. I like that. And I think it's a positive <laughs> note to end on. Otherwise, we could be talking all day. Um, Okay, so I want to thank you very much for for the the rerun. I'm 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 actually pretty excited about the rerun. I think it was a nice conversation to have, and maybe we could think about this kind of format for the uh, for the seminar also, or for further seminars where one has a small group discussion and maybe then records that and puts it up. But um, yeah, okay. Uh, oh, thanks. Nice. Thanks. Nice talking to you. Yeah, great. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yes, hope to see you in the next one, which will be um, uh, Brian Castellani, who's one of the complexity gurus. I'm very excited to hear what he has to say. Okay, thanks so much. And um, you. Okay, bye. Bye.